Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Priest of Copper Beach Financial Group. John, how are you? I'm doing fine, Eric. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. Michael, how you been? I've been excellent. Hopefully you've been the same. Good to uh, talk with you again. Yeah, I have. I uh, You guys told me a little bit about a golf game that you had not too long ago and you, you played golf with a gentleman, Matt Sullivan, and you guys had such a great conversation. You've decided to bring him on as a guest on your podcast. Yeah, Matt is a CEO and founder of American Treatment Network. Uh, which is a center that takes care of drug addictions. And he's got some exciting information to share with us today. It's some, some of it's good news. Some of it's not such good news. And when I talked to Matt on the, on the, on the golf course on a beautiful golf day, that was a little, little warm, but it was great. Uh, Matt and I started to have a dialogue about the problems that exist in our world around us with drug abuse and what's happening at the border potentially, and just opioid epidemic, which has been talked about for the last few years. And I think Matt's passion for this sector is is overwhelming to me. And Matt, why don't you just share a little bit about your past and how you got involved with this particular uh, concept, and, and let's uh, let's move the dialogue. Sure, great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Great to be with you. Great to be with Eric as well. So, yes, uh, American Treatment Network is a product uh, pretty much of my 35 plus years of being in disruptive medical services. Uh, and ever since 2008, I had been involved in addiction treatment. And I had a really unique ability, or I, I had a unique uh, a viewpoint of really what the challenges were with the current addiction treatment models. As we all know, we are in the midst of one of the biggest opioid crises yeah. to hit our country. Terrible. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and that was really exacerbated through the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I always like to tell people is, you know, we think of recovery as a long-term process, but it's with others, right? And we think of addiction as loneliness, being away from others. And when you have a pandemic that adds additional stressors to certainly all Americans, uh, you know, you've seen the numbers really skyrocket from, you know, virtual happy hours with stay at home folks uh, to really folks that have been struggling with addiction, um, not being able to access services. Um, I think at that time we did what we could with telehealth. And I think that's going to fundamentally restructure uh, our. Yeah, that was big. I read yeah, our, our, that, our that model really uh, yeah. and the market. Uh, the good news, I guess, for us is. You know, we, we had always seen telehealth as an ideal vehicle uh, for this disease state. Um, you know, I think what we've really been learning for us is we found that folks really want to be in person. So, you know, they we did what we could during the pandemic. We had virtual groups. Uh, but I think long term, you're going to see telehealth for us really take a place of, you know, the reach and span. For example, we've just expanded all throughout the state of Delaware. And if anybody knows the state of Delaware, they know that it's very big and it's very diverse, right? So we're putting up centers that are totally telehealth enabled, you know, by communication, high def video. Uh, and we expect about 10% of our patients will choose that venue to be treated. Uh, the majority for us, we deal with really sick patients. So they really need that in-person look. We also uh, do other couple interventions where you really need to be in person. But, you know, the background was seeing from a 10,000 foot level, all the struggles that we all know about. You know, if someone struggles with addiction, first thing for us is we like to think about is access. There's so many different venues to get treatment. How do you access the care? Right. So and then the care that you get, is it is it inpatient or is it outpatient? You have to go to detox. So I think they do a real nice job. And what we always follow here is our ASAM guidelines. And ASAM is a standardized uh, grading instrument in our in our industry. And that goes on a scale. And depending after you get assessed by a medical professional, 
they'll go assign you an ASAM score and a, um, a treatment plan is, is implemented. Historically, if a patient's very sick and they need inpatient, I think inpatient is a, a great avenue for that. Um, you know, they they can go away from their friends and family. Typically it's anywhere from two weeks to a couple months. Uh, and they're really able to detox number one, but really retrain behavior, right? Learn how to, you know, be drug free, heavy intensive treatments from behavioral health side. Uh, also holistically, they, they could get medical treatment as well. Uh, and as great as that is, the challenge becomes what happens after they leave that inpatient sure. stay, right? So is it, you know, are they placed in an outpatient program, which is ideal? Do they go to a halfway house or a sober home, which is, is uh, a nice step in the process? Or do they just go back to the, the old environment that they were in, same old stressors? So for a variety of these reasons, you know, that model uh, sees a high rate of relapse, especially if they're not connected to an outpatient program. How high is that, Matt? Uh, that typically can depend on the program, but it can be as high as 80 to 90% within wow. three months. Wow. So it's, it's, it's pretty big. I guess a good way to think of the market also is it's fragmented, right? So there's a lot of different ways to get care, everything from inpatient to outpatient to 12-step programs, And then it depends on the substance. We do really great work with MAT, which we build our company around. um, And that's primarily around opioid treatment, MAT for opioid treatments, uh, some alcohol. But there's some disease, you know, some drugs, uh, methamphetamine, for example, uh, which you really don't have an MAT that you can give the patient. So how we treat that patient is heavy duty uh, behavioral health interventions and such. Hey, Matt, real quick question for you. I, sure. I, we only read what's going on here in the United States. Is this a global epidemic? Is this something that happens throughout the world, or is this, or is it just happening in certain countries at this level? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I think you're always going to see, to some degree, addiction, because we now know that a percentage of the addiction uh, potentially is genetic. So it's almost a mix of your genetics plus early stressors, early trauma. Uh, but you see that to a certain level all over the world. Okay. What you don't see in Europe is the high prescribing of opioids for pain management, like you do in the United States. Uh, opioid, uh, the, the pain management in these other countries, let's just use Europe, for example, you know, they use other modalities in writing pills. They also have for that smaller percentage, we know that roughly anywhere between And again, it's an inexact science, but we know anywhere between three to eight percent of the population could have uh, addiction issues. Um, When you look to Europe and some of the other uh, countries, you know, they're a little bit more progressive on their use of uh, certainly all the modalities, whether it's MAT or inpatient. And they made the decision to spend the money to treat that disease state. It's nowhere as prevalent as it is in the United States. I think in the United States, it's it's really culture. I think our culture is very different than Europe. Um, and I think it's multifactorial, meaning, you know, yes, overprescribings of opioids through the, through the 2010s is a contributing factor. I think our uh, chronic pain is a big problem. There's 50 plus million Americans that suffer with chronic pain. So I think it's very big. I think it's our, our medical ethos you know, to, to want to get people uh, well, number one, but we want, don't want them in pain. It almost became the fifth vital sign back in 2010, where uh, a lot of physicians did not want their patients in pain. So I think you have a, a perfect storm of overprescribing. You also have uh, fentanyl, which is coming into the synthetics that are coming into the counterfeit pills that are on the street from China, primarily. Yeah, scary stuff. Yeah, and Mexico, and that that's killing people. So I think it's multifactorial. But the, the short answer is, you know, Europe has not seen the storm that we have, uh, just because it's it's they treat it differently, but it's also they don't have some of those contributing factors. Now you keep reading about all these lonely souls that live on the streets. I'm assuming that most of them have addiction problems. Would, would, would that be a true statement? 
Yeah, so that's that's also a really great question because most of what we know is it's they also probably have what we call co-occurring disease. Co-occurring disease is as mental health issues. And it when you look at the population we treat here at American Treatment Network, you know, about 80% of our patients have co-occurring mental health issues. These can be as uh, low level as depression, as high level as schizophrenia and serious mental illness. So it's really a, a, a comorbidity of the disease. And I like to think about it almost as chicken and egg. What came first? Was it the mental health that led to addiction or the addiction that led to the mental health? So, so that's what we see in all our patients. I think the biggest difference today is when we speak to people, that image comes to people's mind, you know, whether we're golfing or we're in the community and you share what you do, they think of the poor soul that's addicted under the bridge and homeless and using opioids and, and drugs. And while that is the case in, in obviously right here in Kensington is a very bad part of town. The majority of the folks that we see are your neighbors or your daughters, um, they're your friends, they're, the, they're your short order cooks at, at your restaurants. I mean, these are our fellow citizens in the community. And, you know, what I like to tell people is we all have heard that phrase before, NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need American Treatment Network desperately, but not in my backyard. Well, I, I tell folks it's not in your backyard. It's in your living room. These are your sons and daughters in America that are struggling, you know, with not only addiction, but mental health issues. Good news here is that the payers, I think in 35 years of, of working in this industry, I've only seen three elements line up once before. Uh, and that was back during the AIDS crisis. Uh, and those three elements are the, the, the uh, policymakers, the payers, and the providers. And when you get all three of those stakeholder groups lined up the combated disease state, you're finally going to see some movement. I think you obviously with with the federal government understanding this this problem, they have uh, poured a ton of money into the space. Uh, you have the providers that have um, uh, gone to what we call parity, meaning they treat mental health as well as uh, medical services in parity. I think we need to do more work there. Uh, I think, you know, the payers, you know, are trying to, to holistically treat this, which is great. And we support that because we actually, we do both. We treat medical, we treat psychological, we treat behavioral, and we also have an ancillary services. So we welcome that value-based model. We welcome value-based payments as a way to get uh, pay for performance and good outcomes. Uh, and then lastly, you have the providers. You have individual physicians and large primary care groups that see a lot, the majority of these patients. And they know they're struggling, but they don't have the capacity, the way they're set up in these large primary care or pain management groups to actually do justice to it, real MAT and, and behavioral health interventions like we can do at American Treatment Network. So we have we have a, a built-in base of referrer clients that send us the folks that that struggle in this disease state. Uh, we have had the state, not only the state of Delaware, but the county of Delaware County has appointed us what's called an anchor provider and a preferred provider of the county. They've given us uninsured contracts. The state of Delaware has given us uninsured contracts because they see this model as their best way to deliver high quality evidence-based care at the low price point, which is obviously chronic in nature, right? Long-term right. disease state. We know typically it takes us about a year to two years to get a person really uh, to the state where they can really come off medications. We don't keep them on medications forever. Uh, we like to take them off at a maximum of two years. Well, that's good. Uh, so it's, it's for us, we saw this as an opportunity to mirror the goals of those stakeholders, which is deliver this high quality evidence-based care on a chronic basis in an outpatient setting, which is a low cost setting, and then wrap around all those services. So, you know, happy to report just here in the, the last really year and a half that we've been open, you know, well over a thousand patients in our program. Uh, multi-site locations. Um, we just got a, a, a great 
uh, approval for our OTP centers. So, you know, we have five, six locations ready to go and, and we're just started. I mean, th this really is within a you know 90 mile radius of where we sit. And this is a countrywide problem. So for us, our challenge is the company really is treating the people that are coming through our doors. So it, it's from a business perspective, it's, uh, I guess, a good thing. But from from a fellow citizen and state of the union, so to speak, of what's happening in our country, it's a big challenge that while we hear about it, I, I, I don't think we've really implemented some of the changes that are going to get people better quicker. Matt, are there other other organizations like yours out there, or uh, I'm sensing that they're not? No, there are. Uh, okay. You know, we do not do inpatient. Okay. So one of our, our roles as the uh, anchor provider here in Delaware County is we assess, we're part of a, a coalition of providers that assess all the folks that touch the behavioral health, you know, the, the system, so to speak. People who go into the ER, people who are brought back with a Narcan uh, and shot. You know, these folks have to be assessed. So we, we send a lot of our patients that need inpatient to providers that we know uh, have a good clinical reputation. So, you know, that would be the first step in this process for a lot of folks. Um, but there are outpatient providers, but, but what differentiates us from these outpatient providers is typically they're just behavioral health. So they'll say, yes, we do PHP, we do IOP, we do outpatient treatment and they just get pigeonholed into that one modality. Okay. You know, for us, we believe access is key. So we have open access, meaning a person when they have decided that they've had enough and they want to get better, they can walk into any one of our centers At each of our centers, we are equipped and fit to take care of the patient's assessment needs. Right. So everybody gets, a, they get a medical doctor, Okay, to look at them from a medical perspective, how's this person doing, much like your primary care doctor on once a year visit that we do. You have a psychiatrist uh, that will look at this patient and do mental health assessments. And then we have what we call biopsychosocial evaluation, where we use lower level folks to understand what might be the best course of treatment. So before we even accept anybody into our program, we'll deliver that service and then we'll make the call where they go. The reason why we like to put them here is this is a one-stop shop. This, our, our locations are conveniently located in the community. We're never too far away. And our patients view us truly as their medical provider. They know that they got a medical team that can help them. They know they have a psychological behavioral health team that can help them. We have ancillary services, which um, the major one is our, our own lab. We have a highly complex lab here uh, where we can do the toxicology right on site. Wow. So if somebody presents, we can get them within 24 hours in the treatment, which is huge. Nobody does that. It takes, you know, at best a week. Uh, we can at, at worst, probably a month. The mental health crisis has caused some psychiatrists not to see people at all, or it's a three month wait. So we're proud of our access. We're proud that we can deliver these services uh, to the patient. We like to say it's the right intervention at the right time. And we can get that patient on their way with a team that's got their back. Yeah, Matt, this is Michael. This is really enlightening uh, for me because there's so much that you're talking about that I'm, I was not aware of in terms of really how like bad this this crisis really is and and i i really enjoy hearing your solution uh to this problem but i i want to go back to something that you said a little earlier when you mentioned the nimby type of problem and i really like that comparison in terms of you know it's in your living room i mean this this is really happening all over uh, unfortunately uh, to all different people from all different walks of life and and i want to tie that back a little bit to what we do at Copper Beach, because when we go through a lot of the planning recommendations that, that we work with our families on, particularly in the estate planning uh, arena, we talk a lot with asset protection and a lot of our families are very concerned about that. And one of the things that we bring up that I don't think all of our families 
consider when they're designing their their documents. And I completely get why they wouldn't consider this particular issue because nobody wants to think about having this issue with uh, a family member or a child or something along those lines. But, you know, it really, I think what you're talking about hopefully will enlighten some of our listeners from the standpoint of like, this is, this can really happen to you and to your family. And of course we hope it never does, but it can. And, you know, th- having that estate plan, that asset protection focus, I think from a generational standpoint, you really should consider that just because this, this isn't something that you, you hopefully you're not dealing with it right now, but in the future it could be, and we don't have that crystal ball. So it's nice to be able to protect that upfront. And I'm, I'm interested to know if you, you know, if you've had any experiences with that, you know, with, with families from, you know, let's say the quote unquote traditional walks of life, you know, coming in and and it being sort of a a stunner to the family with how they deal with this issue. So, yeah, it's, it's, we see it a lot actually. So, um, you know, there's, there's no shortage, very high end inpatient, well-known addiction treatment facilities, right? right. Uh, that if you have the money, you know, you can get the access and the care. Our whole model of philosophy is let's deliver that customer experience, the best in class treatment to everybody. And when I make that that uh, comparison, I mean, if you were to look at our, our cross section of folks, these are upper middle class people. They're middle class people with really good jobs. You know, they, have, they work from factories, they work in offices. Um, we do have Medicaid, you know, that is the payer of last resort. There, you know, there's folks, but it goes up and down. And the most, the latest, which is real sad, the latest information now, the government, the statistics from the government is the families of color have really been decimated by this. Their, their rates of addiction during the pandemic almost double that of a Caucasian uh, population. So, it's, it's hitting everybody. I think what, you know, you, you're to be aware of when I, you know, we do family sessions where, you know, we'll bring in the patient at the appropriate time and do family counseling and the counselors deal with that. I had no idea, you know, they think John or Jane are out playing sports and, and, you know, I can only refer it to me when I was young. I mean, you know, yeah, there, there was cans of beer around, but, you know, that was about it. I think the younger, the generation now is challenged with not only vaping, what are you vaping? We have now the legalization of marijuana uh, coming throughout the country. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. So whether, you know, whatever your, your thoughts are on it, right? You know, you have medical marijuana. And so that access is is getting easier. But I think, you know, and everyone's, I think it starts it, it, it's a big impact in families because that's where it starts. And, you know, it's like all the great advice families hear throughout times. It's being involved in your children's lives, being aware, asking questions. Uh, we used to do big uh, uh, awareness sessions with the DEA. And some of the stories that you'd hear about this where these kids would go out and they'd have these pill parties. They'd just go rob the, rob the parents' uh, medicine chest throw all the pills into a bowl, everybody takes a pill and, and the party begins. And the scary thing with medications is um, the, the, the younger generation thinks, well, it's safe. It's, it's you know, it's a safe drug, you know, it's prescribed. Uh, but the, the problem is, if you look at the last time I looked at the data, uh, high school seniors, about 38% experimented with marijuana. Now, this has since been updated. I think this data is a little old. I think that number is now more 50%. We'll experiment with marijuana, right? So marijuana is marijuana. I mean, it's it's. we're not going to debate it's, its pluses or minuses. That's not why I bring this up. But the corresponding rate of high school seniors experimenting with prescription medications, again, this is old data, it was about 8%. So my hypothesis is, and we're seeing this play out now in our, our facilities uh, with this marijuana, which is not your father's marijuana, right? I mean, this is THC through the roof. You see all sorts of emergency room visits uh, for, for marijuana exposure. But what we're seeing is, folks, that, you know, that 8% of those high school seniors experimenting with prescription medication, 
you know, when we lose the stigma, when everyone's trying marijuana, where's that 8% go, right? So it's going to go higher. Uh, and, and you're going to get caught by the snares of the devil when you start playing with medication because it's highly addictive. We've cut down, you know, prescriptions really under three days. I mean, my brother just cut out of a triple bypass and they gave him three days of pain pills, uh, which he didn't take. And, and we, he took a combination of uh, uh, high doses of acetaminophen and, and such. So, so we really have to kind of rethink uh, fr- from a country that, you know, how we want to deal with pain. I think there's a lot of initiatives there. I think we're doing an okay job. But I think everything, like everything else, it begins at the home and being involved in your children's lives. And this is what you do, right? So you're, you're kind of, your role to help a family is how do we've had, thank God, this great success. You know, how can we set up our family for continued success uh, in generations? But, but it's always out there and it's something, you know, whether it's alcohol as well, alcohol is, can be really bad as well. It's just something I think that, you know, good parenting is always, it's an easy answer, but I think the challenges of this generation are greater than a 57 year old guy, you know, and a few cans of beer. Um, You know, the, the drugs are different. The exposures are different. Social media, peer pressure is different. And, and lastly, I'll wrap it up with we're under attack from, from China and, and these cartels from Mexico, because these, counterfeit pills because they, you know, they're, they're hard to get. They're laced with fentanyl and car fentanyl. Yeah. It's terrible. It, and, and it's gotten so bad that the drug companies are now making higher dose naloxone, which is, which is Narcan. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of many challenges. I think the good, the good news uh, for all this is, you know, there is a focus on it. There's a bright light on it. We're, there's still stigma associated with it, but we're trying to work through that stigma. And and uh, but to answer the question, yeah, we we see a lot of we purposefully put our locations, you know, in areas middle class up to upper middle class areas uh, that certainly can touch all demographics. I sit here at Havertown, Villanova, one of the richest uh, zip codes in the country, is is four miles from here. And four miles from here is West Philadelphia, right? So, so we really pick our locations where we can treat really all the different types of folks, whether without regard to their uh, socioeconomic strata. Hey, Matt, listen, that, that was great. Uh, we're, we're, we're running a little short on time. I'd like to have you back uh, at the next uh, podcast. And let's focus more on uh, maybe some case studies Sure. How you implement your programs more, sure. more, more, how you get involved in, in the reach out side of things. I know you get referrals, but there's some, maybe right. some other opportunities where, where uh, we need maybe a little bit clearer how you get these wonderful uh, patients come into the door and, and want some treatment. Um, so with that, thanks for your time today, Matt. It was great educational. It's scary stuff. You're in the thick of it. I think every parent out there should, and will be and probably are very concerned, maybe not talking about it. So hopefully this will open up some of the discussions around the table. Yeah, thanks, Matt. This yeah, I appreciate the time. I'd encourage your listeners if they want more information, certainly they can go to our website, www.americantreatment.com. Uh, there's some resources there uh, and pick up the phone. We, we love talking to people and we can help uh, part of the solution. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Matt. Matt, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. You beat me to the punch. I was going to ask you for some contact information. So I'm so glad that you put that out there. And Michael, I'm going to ask you the same thing. If if folks are concerned about their situation, their family, um, and they, they just don't want to pick up the phone yet and call Matt, but they do want to talk to you guys about how you can help to implement some protection uh, things within their own strategy. Uh, Why don't you give them your contact information as well at Copper Beach? Sure. You can reach us on our website, www.cbfgllc.com. And we're on LinkedIn and some other social media platforms as well. Yeah. And for the listener, this is not something that is brand new to Copper Beach. We've had multiple discussions on many podcasts. Go back and listen to some of those. Um, there's a lot that can be done. And this is not 
an isolated incident. This is not something that you're suffering through alone or that you're concerned about by yourself. This is something that has been around for a very long time and will continue, unfortunately. Uh, but there are folks that are you know, out there to that have your best interest in mind. And these are some of them right here on this podcast. So please reach out to them uh, again, Matt. Thank you so much for being on the show. Gentlemen, thank you so much for facilitating this. And our last thank you goes to the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it and leave a review as this actually does help other people find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. American Portfolios, Copper Beach, and American Treatment Network are unaffiliated entities.